Hi. See, what do I look like? I need lipstick. I lost my lipstick. It fell out of my purse. It's probably underneath the seat <laughs> of my car. But, but I always remember, oh, you don't have lipstick until this happens. So there you go. Hello, Paula. <laughs> hey, I can see him. Here, can't hear you. Hi, Paula. Speak to us, Paula. I can't hear you. Nancy, yeah, not muted. Paula. Paula, Paula, speak to us. We can't hear you. Okay, how about now? Oh yeah, so. Okay. Yeah, His microphones work amazing. There you are. Yeah, it helps when you turn these things on. <laughs> I found that out. <laughs> The little thing. Right, you can see the screen I'm sharing and everything, and it looks right. I can. Yeah. 
You can. You can, yes. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Very good. All right, Mr. Tripoli, come on with it. Oh, boy. I need, I have not had alcohol in a while, and I need alcohol. Are they still giving away free alcohol next door? No. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking we need to have a margarita today. Oh. I know, right? So next week, Paula, mm -hmm. um, still Monday and Tuesday over there, but I know Judy wanted you over here one day. So mm -hmm. you want to do Monday over here and Thursday over here? Would that work? Sure. sure. Yeah. And then I'll have Jana Tuesday and Wednesday over there. Okay. So you're Monday in Gainesville and Thursday in Denton. Okay. If I can do that. Work. And then Judy will be here Thursday and then I'll work on the stuff. I think she just wants to hang out with you and then we can go drink. Hey. Yes. Hey, that works. We have clients we need to meet with for sure. Uh, yeah. So speaking of, um, you know, have you been to the new Angelina's yet? I have not. You know, it's beautiful and they did a wonderful job. And the upstairs is beautiful and downstairs are decor. But Roger said that Don Camillo's, you know, it's not open yet. He goes, but the inside is wow. He goes, you know, Angelina's is wow. It's good. But Don Camillo's, he goes, it is it's impressive. So wow. Okay. Yeah. So I haven't been over to Holland Village. I really didn't realize that there was so much over there now. I know. I know. And that's why Hickory Creek's trying to catch up. But I know Highland Village, whenever I finally I have a cousin that lives there, but when I finally got into the business part of it, I'm like, wow, I know all this uh -huh. stuff is there. I did not know. I looked One it up our, and saw all of you know very upscale uh, yeah. yeah stores and stuff kind of like some of the south lake stuff yeah yeah and folks up here are stepping up the game aren't they i know right <laughs> oh goodness where is everybody excellent question so where's chris this this last minute stuff is just makes me crazy. See, you know, my son used to tell me he was scared of me when he was growing up. And I said, good. Then I was doing my job, obviously. But I very much feel it coming on again. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's Jana. Hello. You're muted, Jana. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> Jana, you're muted. Well, you're talking, but we can't hear you. <laughs> Do you know how to unmute? It's just the button at the bottom that says mute or unmute. Do you have Correct. your cell phone? You're unmuted now, but we can't hear you. Try your cell phone. Yeah, try that. Call in with your cell phone. Who is that, Judy?
excuse me. Okay, Miss Paula. Hi, Roger. Yes. yes. All right. So um, Chris Tripoli cannot connect, so he is going to call in. It is an eight three two number. You will be able to introduce him and say, you know, technical difficulties, but we still manage to have him. We won't be able to see him, and he doesn't have any slides to share. However, we uh, will let him talk. And we'll introduce him, you know, like you're doing, and let him talk, and then uh, and we'll just introduce it that way. How about that? That'll okay. work. Can you see my face? Yeah, I'm good. So, Jana, so we hear you yes. talking on the phone. Jana, Jana. Yeah. Okay, we can hear you on the phone, so you can mute now. Okay. So we don't have all the background. Talk on the phone. But but you still just want to mute. So we, you know, right, but it doesn't show that you're muted. Judy, can you mute everybody? There's Chris. Yeah. Thank you, Judy. You is, is that, is you, that Chris? Chris? Yeah. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You're the eight three two four dot 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 three four. All righty. Wow. Okay. So that was kind of a rough one. But since we've got you know so many more to go, I'm gonna have to get to the bottom of this before we get into the because we've got four more that you're probably gonna want to do on the same platform. Yeah. So we're gonna have to get into how I can somehow use WebEx because for some reason. So let's yeah, practice it. Yeah, so let's practice for him. We can set up some WebEx and and figure out yeah. you know whatever technology you need. I've let's got, practice I've got presentations on Skype that works. I've got presentations on uh, Zoom that works. Okay. Um, but something's going wrong here. Okay, cool. So yeah, so WebEx is what um, our NCTC our host has uh, purchased the license for, so that we can have multiple people. So, but we'll practice okay. beforehand. But we're so glad you're here. And you we'll give it just this, right? So you're still going to be able to record and have it, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, good. Good, yeah. good, good. That's because I, I like that. I just think these are so good. You get this information now, but it's re but it's yours. You got it recorded. You can use it for clients three months from now when they come in. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now again, y'all still see my blue screen? Is that still being shared? Everybody yes. else. Okay, good, yes. good. All right. We'll give it, Chris, we're going to give it just a couple more minutes. And then, okay. and then Paula is going to welcome everyone and get started and then turn it over to you. And then you can handle it as you need to. And then, of course, Paula will take it at the end and uh, then do the closing. All right. But we'll, we'll give people just a few more minutes because it doesn't look like we have um, a lot of people. We're getting a few of them. They're coming. Okay, okay, this will be good. Yeah. So, you know, there's one of those things when you have to use technology, we're going to have difficulties from time to time. But it's wonderful that we do have ways. We have options A through Z to overcome, right? Yeah. Oh, very good. We're well, I haven't done one this way, but I'm so glad you thought of it because I was sitting there <laughs> freaking thinking, how in the world? And I, well, yeah, you always have the backup phone. <laughs> Yep, even if we have to call in. Um, you know, I don't know if we have a picture of you. I could look and see if I can display your picture. Did you send us a picture of you? Uh, I think I think so. Didn't I give you a, uh, my biographic information in a recent headshot? Yeah. Maybe. Back when we were... Yeah, so let me see. Maybe I can get I to so. that and um, share that when you start talking. Let's see. And I can switch the screen. All right. Well, Chris, I was having some technical difficulties as well, but then I figured out that I have to turn on my headset. <laughs> it's always something. It's, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's the little details. 
Well, I'll, I'll find that in a few minutes. I'm not able to do it when I'm doing the sharing the screen, but afterwards, after you get started, then somewhere in, in the process, then I'll share your picture. I'll share that on there. So now how long is this one? This is for one hour? Or is it an hour? Uh, yeah, it's probably gonna be more like an hour and 15 minutes and then still, and then have time at the end for questions, if any. Okay, we have it scheduled from two to 3.30 is what we have it scheduled for. Exactly. Okay. All right, very good. good. Okay, well, Paula, I think we'll turn it over to you. You can get us started, and then people can join us as they need to. And okay. All right, let's get this show on the road here. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Restaurant Reality, the future of service. I'm Paula McCain. I'm a recovery business advisor here at the uh, North Central Texas Small Business Development Center, and my cat has been trying to use my computer all day. I don't know why. She has to send an email or something. Uh, SBDC is the leading provider of assistance for small businesses. We're grant funding, and that allows us to offer our services at no cost to you. This is the 12th in the COVID-19 funded presentations. Just a, a, a little housekeeping. If you have any questions, put them in the chat room. And when we come to the Q&A portion, uh, I'll be happy to read those out. Let me introduce to you Chris Tripoli. Chris has 40 years experience in the hospitality industry as a designer, a concept developer, an owner, and an operator. He assisted with the rapid expansion of casual restaurant, casual family restaurant. And he's developed uh, award winning restaurants in the airports and convention centers, theaters, parks, and retail center projects. He teaches, so you want to open a restaurant at the University of Houston SBDC. He co-authored a book, So You're Thinking About Owning, Operating, or Investing in a Restaurant. He founded, uh, or he founded the A la Carte Food Service Consulting Group. He started a podcast called Corner Booth, and he writes for the RestaurantOwner.com and Restaurant Startup and Growth Magazine. And he assists the SBDC, SBDC advisors all over the state. He's a very busy person. So Chris, take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And welcome everyone. Thank you so much for spending time this afternoon with us. Uh, and a thanks so much again to the Small Business Development Center for being able to make this type of thing possible. Restaurant Reality is going to be a five part series. Uh, and I hope that you'll be able to uh, visit with us on each one of them. Uh, we're going to be talking today mostly about service, but we're going to be spending the other days talking about other topics that um, are creating challenges for today's restaurant operator. Today, as I mentioned, we'll be spending mostly our, our points on how COVID and conditions and customer buying habits have impacted the way restaurants have to change their service model. Uh, our next topic is going to be how menus been affected, and we'll talk about some specific examples of how independent restaurant operators throughout the state have been winning with the menuing and packaging through the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, after that, we're going to be doing a, a little, uh, spending a little bit of time on leadership development, management, owner's responsibility, staff selection and training. All that's going to be in uh, the February 11th uh, Restaurant Reality webinar. Um, then we're going to do finances on the 18th. So please make time for Restaurant Reality. Know your numbers because we're going to be talking a lot about how independent restaurant operators are getting sharper on numbers that they're structuring directly from POS and how to better understand your P&L and how to manage your numbers by the week. And then our last segment of Restaurant Reality is going to be about marketing how independent restaurant operators are meeting the challenge of staying in tune with their current guests, how marketing changes have, uh, have modified the way people now advertise and use media. 
So that's going to be the service, um, and uh, and that's going to be sort of the overview of our Restaurant Reality Series. Again, I thank you for coming. Uh, at any time I'm talking about an item that you'd like to know more about, just type that into the chat room, or if it makes you think of a question you want to ask, we're going to make sure that we get to that. Most everybody knows that 2020 was an absolute um, absolute curveball to the industry like none other. It's really hard to put into um, into words just how many modifications restaurants had to be faced with because of this you know unforeseen issue. Um, but what I want to talk about today is how so many of the reactions that we made were really tied to trends that actually started before the pandemic and how we can actually profit from things that we've learned through the pandemic. So this way we can try to find, um, you know, find the, the embers from this unbelievable storm and kind of start a new fire that's going to take us into success. Uh, let's not dwell on the fact that the restaurant um, numbers that came out were absolutely dismal, and we knew they were going to be. But those of you that saw the numbers that I saw on Monday of this week saw that the National Restaurant Association did put out to the SBA and to other agencies exactly what we were expecting, which was 2020 was a very, very dismal year for the industry and an absolute hardship like none ever uh, we've ever seen before for the independent restaurant operator. The totals meant that we were off sales um, in 2020 from previous year by $245 billion. And 2020 was a year that actually started out with expectations of continued revenue increase. We were supposed to have a slight 25 to 3% increase. Instead, we lost $245 billion. Over 110,000 small independently owned restaurants have closed nationwide. And that's resulted in a loss of just under two and a half million jobs from previous year. So those are those are that's sort of the dismal um, umbrella that we're working under. But let me tell you what I think. Two things came out of that um, that made sense. There's two good things that came out of 2020 that I think helps the public look at what you do as an independent restaurant operator differently. Two things. One is before COVID-19, I don't think many people that are your regular customers realize just how large and how valuable the restaurant and food service industry is to the community and to the overall economy at large. Many people were surprised to learn, you know, that restaurants um, are a significant um, impact, uh, economy impact generator, sales tax collector, job provider. Uh, it's the number two, hospitality is the number two force of job employment we have in the nation. I think too many independent uh, restaurant customers just looked at our business as, you know, going down the street on Friday and saying hi to Harry, the guy that runs the restaurant that they see all the time, and splitting the pizza and having a cocktail. I don't think before COVID they realized that, you know what, you add up all the Harry's, and we are a very, very large, meaningful, uh, impactful uh, industry. We employ, you know, um, we employ millions of people, second only to the government, and uh, the economic impact has been devastating to uh, the economy as a whole. So now they sort of know why they need to support us so much, because restaurants aren't just that small independent restaurant on the corner. As an industry, uh, we're tremendously large. I think the second thing that helps uh, is that not before COVID uh, do many independent restaurant upper customers that go to these restaurants realize how hard you work for what thin margin you get. I think too many independent uh, restaurant operators are looked at to the customer as uh, very, very successful money-making machines because they come into our restaurants, they see that they're busy, or they sit down and they order a $20 uh, menu item, and they think because of that, these restaurants must make a whole bunch of money. Okay, then COVID-19 came along and PPP and the CARES Act, and everyone started realizing, wow, these restaurants need our support. These guys are off a tremendous amount of volume, and without the volume, they all lose money. Why do they lose money? Because most restaurants operate on a margin of 10 cents or less on the dollar. 
And the public, I don't think, ever realized that. Now they realize why, as hands-on restaurant operators, you need them so badly and you need so much volume. You need many, many dollars because you only get to keep the dimes. So the more dollars in, the more dimes, and in some cases less than a dime, we actually get to, to keep. So those are that's sort of a, a little bit of positive lining, I think, that has come out of uh, 2020 is a better understanding of the community, of just how significant we are as an industry, how much impact we have on our community, and what a tiny margin we work off of, which is why we need them so much and so regularly. So even though it was a down year generally, and even though we had restaurant closers, and yes, we've lost a tremendous amount of employees, convenience dining was up. So some of you that are successful in the convenience network probably already realize this. Your drive throughs were busier. Your takeout was busier. Uh, pickup curbside was up 30 to 50% in most restaurants. Third-party delivery was going crazy. Um, it's, it's because people adjusted how they dine out. Uh, throughout the nation and certainly in the great state of Texas, dining out is one thing we do. It's what we do. Uh, so it isn't necessarily looked at as a luxury. It isn't just what business people do for lunch. Or it isn't just what we would do with our children to take them out for a reward because the report card was good. Dining out is a lifestyle. And it is part of our everyday makeup. It's, it's part of what we do as a, as a two-income family, depending upon restaurants, or um, as people who are uh, up in years relying on restaurants, or as young singles meeting and greeting and relying on restaurants. So when COVID-19 comes and you had to have restricted dining, in most cases you had closure for a while, some were restricted to outside dining, we had to shift greatly because people still wanted to dine out. So it makes sense to me that they, they dined out in different manners. And that's why they were driving you nuts with requests for online ordering and third-party delivery and more specials at the pickup window and curbside. drive throughs fast food were up anywhere from 7 to 25% last year. So there was a little silver lining. So what do we do with that, you know, with that convenience dining increase? Um, we want to uh, understand that um, it makes a big year but it also changes the buying habit. So it wasn't just a big year. We've got customers that are expecting now convenience. They're expecting restaurants to be able to service them through their need for delivery. Um, there are major restaurant groups that are redesigning their dining rooms to make bigger curbside pickup counters and make it easier for people to do online ordering and come and pick up takeout food. There are some casual restaurants that are now developing drive through windows. These are different ways to serve the growing needs of the customer. So this tells me that the need for convenience isn't just a fad. It isn't just a short-term thing that COVID made us do. It's a dining out trend. We've modified our customer's behavior. So they're going to be expecting rapid service, and more convenience as we go forward. So do you remember when we used to talk about the four walls of marketing um, being everything that was done inside your dining room, that the best marketing was creating the experience? A, a successful experience is always the best form of marketing. And remember, we always used to teach that. It was called the four walls of marketing because that's how you create the experience inside your restaurant. Well, it's the service that creates that experience. Not so much the dining room, not so much the walls, it's the service. And the service has changed slightly uh, and dramatically. And not just for the short term, but forever. So the four walls are changing to now include outside pickup, curbside, some relationship with your third party delivery, drive through service if it's appropriate, and phone ordering. The use of technology now, web ordering, online ordering. So these might be the first couple of things you're already noting down to make, uh, to make a review of. Is your online ordering quick and convenient? Is your phone ordering system thorough, polite? Because this is a new level of service. It's a new way and a new time for us to, live, to deliver service. So since we're talking about service, since we're talking about the impact of service, do we look at convenience now as service? We used to, for years, look at convenience as something separate 
and service. So is convenient service? My answer to that is it better be. It better be now. It better be in each of your concepts, whether those of you participating today are full service casual, maybe some of you are just our breakfast bakery coffee shops, some of you might be uh, regional barbecues, some might be more fine dining. At every level, we've got to adjust our service to make sure that it includes some level of convenience. Convenience is part of service. So how did that happen? How did convenience become service? Um, this is where I kind of go back to say, you know, I'm not so certain that it was just COVID. I'm not so certain about that. I think the future of service began a little before that. Most of you that are participating today probably know that technology has been impacting your business before COVID, um, that people were doing more website checking for hours and directions. People were already getting used to online ordering. People were already using third-party delivery. Right. Um, many people were looking for those packages that were available for takeout only. Uh, Amazon had taught us for the last few years the convenience of going online and ordering things and getting them quickly. So convenience has been sort of taught to us before COVID. So then if we can just imagine COVID appears quickly, we had very little knowledge of the effects of it. We had very little time before the regulations came to, to force our closure. Uh, so it's almost like if you imagine a big five-gallon drum of gasoline coming and being dropped on, an, on a fire that had already been started. The convenience fire had already been burning and had already been affecting our industry. And then COVID comes along, you know, and like a, a flamethrower ignites it. And so overnight, all of us had to adjust. And I think the reason we had to adjust is because convenience creates a higher sense of the value of time. And our customers have realized now that their time changed, working from home instead of going to work. Their time changed, things they have to do with their children with teaching at home. Their time changed uh, you know, because of the way they were social distancing from others. And so when you add that to the fact that they were already conveniently using their handheld for ordering, their Amazon for delivery, um, their third-party delivery. It stands to reason that convenience becoming a major part of the puzzle of delivering service to a restaurant became a reality because we value our time. We expect things to be quicker. I think that's one reason why we now have to look at making sure convenience is part of our service model because people are valuing their time differently. And I think the other reason is because of the effects of marketing. You know, we react so well to marketing, don't we? What we're taught, what we see, the repetition of marketing sort of creates um, the, um, the world that we live in. And how does that impact the restaurant service? Well, well, I'll tell you, I think marketing and marketing of convenience has started over years and it has created a generation of today's restaurant customers that were brought up in a serviceless society. So they're expecting convenience because they've been taught for years that convenience is a part of service, maybe not so much in restaurants up to now, but certainly as a part of their daily life. I'll take you back a little bit and you can probably see some of these examples. And this is maybe how we, we got started perhaps in learning um, that marketing can reteach um, how we look at service. I, I'll take a look at how we use banks now. There's a whole generation of people that are out there working uh, and hopefully ordering from your restaurant they don't know banking the way we may if we were older and we were banking in the 80s and the 90s before everyone decided that ATM and debit cards and 24-7 banking and online bill paying and taking photos for your deposits replaced going into a bank. But remember, there was a time where banking service was actually personal. You went to the bank. I mean, I think it's hard for us to remember when was the last time we actually went into a bank? for regular banking purposes. Do you remember that? Remember those people behind the counter called tellers? When was the last time we actually saw a teller? But banking used to operate on a service level that way. That industry um, was a person-to-person -person industry. That's how money was handled, eyeball to eyeball. Remember your name, see you every other Friday, get your deposit, 
Um, there was always those friendly contests. Remember, open a new account, win a toaster. We probably didn't need the toaster, but that's how they were servicing us. Um, and and um, we knew the banker. The banker had a name. We knew the teller. They knew us. But what happened? You know, with technology and then the way it's marketed, now even people that are low-tech, and I would put myself in that category, have reacted to marketing where we feel like the better way to bank is to listen to what they say and do 24-7 banking on our own. If you wake up in the middle of the night um, and you're awake for a little while, hey, why not check your bank account? You can. Why not apply for a credit card? You can. You can do a loan application. You can check your account. You can take pictures of checks as they're mailed to you. If you're still getting checks by mail, you can do deposits that way. We ATM, we debit, and we don't need a bank. It's how we bank. And because they market it that way for our convenience, we believe that's the service we're getting. We still pay a service charge, right? I know I am. But the service has been created differently. It's all about the convenience of what we can do for ourselves at any time of the day. We don't want to just pick on banking, but over the same period of time, we've seen air travel reteach us what to expect. Again, for our convenience, it's much less service, but because it's for our convenience, we seem to accept it. How many of you remember when you actually used to go to the airport, uh, airport and get your boarding pass? Uh, you used to have to go up to the counter and someone was there to confirm your flight arrangements and print out your boarding pass and take your bags. Yes, I said, take your bags. That's what we used to do, bags, plural. Now, you know, we don't just give our bags. We pay to give our bags. Or because of marketing, we feel special that maybe our first bag is free because we used the right credit card or we accumulated a, a, a lot, enough points or we got the preferred seating. Um, and because of that, we could check in one bag free. So they market it that way. We join the club. We use the membership points. We're doing the work ourselves. Um, we're still paying more to travel than we did years ago, and we get less. And this is before we even get on the plane. <laughs> now, once you're on the plane, forget about the passing out of the blankets and the passing out of the pillows. You know, we used to even get the passed out food. Not that everyone really thought it was that um, a big of a deal, but it gave us something to look forward to. It was included in the price. Sometimes it also gave us some comedy to talk about. I mean, I know you all have that same story I do where you're sitting on the airplane and you're sitting next to the person and somebody got the ham sandwich, someone got the turkey sandwich, but you couldn't really tell which was which. It wasn't that we were looking for the finest quality. It's just that it was something that was part of the service. It came, it came along, and it made you feel complete. Your time was complete because you were getting service. They were giving us comfort with blankets and pillows and food uh, to nibble on, even if it may not be good. Remember when they had TVs that dropped and they had complimentary movies to watch? And, and now, however, for our convenience, we can do all that ourselves. You bring your own blanket. You bring your own thing to wrap around your neck. You bring you know, your own pillow. You bring your own food, um, uh, and you bring your own uh, laptop or handheld movie device because for your convenience, they allow you to watch your own programming because they have the Wi-Fi. So, so if you do decide to order something, that means now you're going to get a menu, and you're going to be paying an extra $9, 10 11 $12 for maybe a little squirt of hummus on some stale crackers or some candy or Pringles chips. And... Um, because, however, it's for our convenience and it's marketed that way, we've adjusted. It's the new service level. The service level has been driven by less service but better marketing, and that's the convenience of air travel, just like that's the new convenience of banking. Um, even something more basic than that, just think of how we've changed the, the need to give our car gasoline. There are some of us that might remember that on every corner, there used to be what we called the service center because it was a gas station that delivered service. Do you remember where you drove in, you normally drove over something, it made a noise, a bell went off or a light blinked, somebody came out, waved to you, said hello, they pumped the gas for you, they opened up the hood, they would check the air in your tires, the oil in your engine. Sometimes there were contests, do you remember that? Uh, picking up S&H green stamps or gold bond stamps or get a fill up on Thursday and, and because of that you get a steak knife or something. Again, things that maybe didn't necessarily need, but it was a way of delivering service personal ability, eyeball to eyeball, please and thank you. And we don't see that anymore. It's because now we get gas at the corner convenience store. 
We don't even call it a gas station, really. We don't certainly don't call it a service station. It's a convenience store because all the major brands of gasoline have these convenience brands, the Tiger Mart, the Quick and Go, you know, the Grab and Eat, whatever it is. We have these convenience concepts now that are on every corner with the gas pumps out front. So you can go in if you want to, and you can, you know, walk through the the uh, powder donuts that you don't need and things like that so that you can pay there if you want to. Um, and the service that you get there is unbelievable. You know that the training manual for somebody that works behind the counter at these convenience stores only really needs one page because they only say two words. Thank you, next. Thank you, next. Or, of course, you can do what most people do, and they just opt for the new convenience, which is do everything yourself. Just get out, swipe the card, pump the gas, Get back in. If you wanted to service the car, do it yourself. You're going to wipe the windows, um, and then you're going to take off. And because it's marketed as convenient, zip in, zip out, um, that this is our new level of service. This is what we're teaching people to, to accept. This is what the restaurant customers that you serve see when they're out and about doing other things. Where I draw the line is the grocery store. I'm the one in the family that shops, and I know we can do it online, and I see many people pulling into the supermarkets and having them load the back. You can do curbside pickup if you like. You can even have the food delivered. This is more convenience, and convenience has become the service because the service in the store is totally different. Um, I still want to pick my own tomatoes, I guess. Um, I'm still going to have them slice you know, the lunch meat that I pick out at the deli. Uh, I miss, and I know due to COVID, we needed to stop this, but I miss the weekend little demo um, counters that would be set up, Um, the little folding tables that might be open, or there'd be the volunteer passing out little samples of things in the white paper souffle cups. Remember, it might be some lunch meat, it might be some new cheese or a dip that the brand of of supermarket is trying to promote. Um, It may not be on your shopping list. You may not really need it. I would go out of my way to talk to the people, listen to their spiel. If they gave me a good sales pitch, I tasted it. I liked it. I probably bought it. So that was the service experience that I was looking for. And boy, of course, I missed that. But now you load the cart, you get what you need, then you go up to get checked out. And what do you see? You see all of these self-serve checkout um, counters. See, and that's where I draw the line. I'm thinking, no, thank you. I do pump my own gas. I do 24-7 my own banking. And I understand air travel, you know. Um, I do all of that online. I've got my iPhone boarding pass. I get it. But you know what? Someone is going to actually ring me up, bag my groceries, look me in the eye, say thank you, I don't care if they mispronounce my name, but what I'm not going to do is go on up to the self-serve checkout because that's supposed to be for my convenience. I know the signs are welcoming, and every once in a while, you'll even hear somebody. You'll get the manager on the uh, microphone. You guys remember this? They'll say, that. hey, Kroger shoppers, thank you so much for shopping today for your convenience. Self-serve checkout, number one, two, three, four, five, and six are open. Thinking, really? Really? That's how you want to thank me. That's the marketing now is I can pick up my own food. Now I can ring it up, bag it. It's going to be the same price. But because it's for my convenience, that's the new level of service. Many people do it. I just can't do it. Uh, I would almost prefer that the next time they want to do that marketing sales pitch, that the Kroger manager picks up the microphone and says, hey, Kroger shoppers, thanks for coming in. To help me save $15 an hour on the employees, I've got six cash registers with no one there, and you can use it yourself. So please, for your convenience, check out yourself and help me save some money. That's what I'd much rather hear. So what has this happened? Why are we talking about these other industries? Because it has changed the customer expectation of service and because it has developed characteristics in your staff. You knew we'd be getting to that. You can't talk about service without service staff. But the characteristics of today's service staff are developed from the world that they are in. And if we're hiring people that have been born anywhere in the last 40 years, they were raised in a high-tech environment with a serviceless society. 
So that every day, please, thank you, eyeball to eyeball courtesy that you would hope that was just innate is not. And it is now incumbent upon us to include it into service training. So you wanna talk about that for a few minutes? Let's talk about service training. The future of service is a modified way of doing service training. The way we used to do service training in restaurants, and I've worked with so many, um, fine dining, fast food, um, regional, national brands. What I like the most are the hands-on independents, the chef-run restaurant, the husband and wife-owned restaurant. Um, and what I see most of the time, and this matches the way I did it when I owned mine. What I see most of the time is service training that was set up on the best producer. Is that how you're still doing it? That was the old way we used to train. It would be, let's find who we feel is the best producer in that department. So the best person on the cooking line or the best person doing prep, the best server, the high sales bartender. By best producer, we typically mean that, someone who's creating the most revenue, um, somebody who is maybe the longer tenured, been around a long time. And so then what's the approach? The trainee is told to follow. Follow Robert. Why? Because Robert's been here the longest. He knows where everything is. He's going to show you how we open, close, set up the stations, do the side work. He'll tell you what we expect from service. So just follow and watch Robert. Now, when Robert says you're ready, gives me the thumbs up, then you're ready. And then in addition to that, there's sometimes a handbook, some reading materials, um, and perhaps a written test for the menu. So does that sound like the way you're still training? That's the way we used to do it, really. But most people are changing, and if you haven't, I'm gonna ask that you do, because you'll have great success with the way today's staff person learns if we shift that from the longest tenured or the best sales to the best trainer. Because the, the thing is, sometimes the longest server that's been on the schedule the longest, or the best tenured bartender, or maybe the uh, fastest cook on the line, um, or the high sales uh, server. Uh, sometimes they're just simply not the best trainer. See, they can be best in their world, they might be the best at the work, but unless they really do wanna take the time, unless they're really good with communication skills, unless they're really good with being thorough to follow the checklist and the trainer guide, what you're going to get is poor training you're just getting it from the longest tenured, better producing person. So that has changed. And, and I'm kind of glad it has. I've spent many, many years um, with great success helping people adjust to the future of service by first adjusting how we train. So here are the key points about that. The future of service training basically starts with selection. Make sure that you're selecting by plan not necessarily by need. Uh, the, by plan, I mean the people must be a fit. So if they must be a fit, that means we must actually develop what it is that we would say is a fit for that position. Maybe not just the work characteristics, uh, but how about the personal compatibility with the team, uh, the personality, the work ethic that you might be looking for? You're really looking for someone who's going to be a fit, not just someone who needs a job. And you say, great, you need a job, you're at the right time, because I'm short a cook and I need a cook. That type of selection method is really Russian roulette. And for every hit, we normally get a lot more misses. So select by plan. You should always be looking. You should always be interviewing. Uh, you should have an interview system where people help interview with you. You've got an interview checklist of the five or six or seven important things that you're looking for. So first we select by plan so that they're actually a fit with our work environment and, and they fit within our team, not just by need. And then the second step is work with those key people that you feel could be the best trainers, the ones that are interested in training, that have good suggestions, that are thorough with checklists, that can spend the extra time, that have good communication skills, and put together a training program with their input. We call that train the trainer. So this way the trainers know what's expected, what process to follow to train everyone from hostess to busser, from dishwasher 
the server from cook to bartender. So the trainers are actually trained first. So step one is selection. Step two is a training guide, a training process. And you do this with the input of the people that are being, um, uh, that are becoming the trainers. Now you've got a training team. See, now, now it's working. You've got a training team. Yes, maybe some of them are the people who have been there the longest, but not necessarily. Sometimes maybe they are the people who are the full-time staff person working five, six days a week. But I've worked with many trainers that aren't. They're just very good trainers, and they might be looking at this as a part-time job. They work three or four shifts, but in addition to that, they do all the training just because they're excellent at it. So once we've done the selection plan, once we've done the train the trainer, then comes the steps of the actual training. And you want to make sure that your training method now engages all of the senses, uh, all the senses. It can't just be, Robert's a good trainer, follow him. Okay, because they can't just walk around and watch and then be trained. But if they do some watching and they do some listening, but then we turn it and they do some, um, some demonstrating. Now we've got them doing some talking. They do some reading, some writing, and some tasting of the menu items. If we get all five senses involved. You've got a very thorough way of training, and you've got a lot more um, hope that their retention level is going to be higher. Younger people today seem to be learning through the impact of the technology, and so the more they can not just listen or the more they can not just read, but do a little reading, a little listening, a little talking, a little tasting, the, the more they're going to be able to retain. And that's what it's all about. I mean, training isn't just a, a mechanism of I showed you, I hope you remember, now go on out there and do it. It's got to be, I showed you, you bonded with it, you understood it, um, you retained it, so you understand why, not just what. And because you understand why, you're more interested in demonstrating the steps of service at the table, or you're more interested in delivering the consistent plate presentation on the line, or you're more interested in actually doing the recipe prep according to the hanging recipe every single day because you bonded with the training program. It wasn't just something I was told to do because if I was just told to do something, today's staff person sometimes remembers and sometimes doesn't. And, and that is a sometimes training program that results in an all the time disappointment to the restaurant owner operator. I wish we were in the classroom at this point because I probably see your head shaking going, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm normally disappointed in my training. We spend a lot of time. We show them. We think they got it. And then a few weeks into the job, they don't have it. Now, the recipe is inconsistent. They forgot something, or they're laying out my food plate differently than I showed them, or they forgot a step of service at the table, and so I'm thinking, oh, my God. That brings the question, why do I spend all this time on training if today's staff isn't going to remember and do a good job anyway? And you all know the answer to that. You know, um, the only other choice we have is not to do good training. And then what if they stay a long time? So I realize we have turnover. And some people talk themselves out of a training program because they feel like these people aren't going to stay very long anyway. But the only alternative is if we did bad training, and then what if they stay? That doesn't help. That's worse. So digital programs, making personal videos. This is really demonstrating the future of service. Uh, earlier today, somebody was telling me um, in their restaurant in Alexandria, uh, Louisiana, that they just updated their welcome uh, video. And I thought, what a wonderful idea. This is a small restaurant, Lee and Tracy Gwynn. They have one restaurant, a husband and wife team. And um, they decided that, you know, uh, we want to update our welcome to the new employees. So we took the bullet points out of the handbook, uh, and we just set up, and we had a really good in-house video, which people can do now off of their handheld devices, um, their iPhones. And so now you get a video, the same kind of thing that you might want to post on YouTube, but instead you're putting it on your website as a welcome to new staff. Our environment is what? Our work environment offers what? Our family of um, staff are important because why? Our commitment to the community is what? You know, our level of commitment to high standards of service to the customer is what? Fill in the gaps, develop your story, and then 
make it in a welcoming video. Uh, it's the same kind of thing that maybe we used to read in an employee handbook. Uh, but these are easy to do now. It used to be video training was hard to do and very expensive, which is why only the national chains were doing things like this. And most of the people, um, certainly the people that are probably participating today that are hands-on uh, restaurant operators weren't doing those programs. But as with all other technology, as things proceed, we develop new ways of doing things, and these new ways seem to also lessen the cost. So doing some type of video training, whether it's the owner's welcome, whether it's the food presentation, maybe that's something that you want to do where your breakfast menu or your weekend brunch menu or maybe your basic house specialties. You want to make sure that each one of these are videoed so for training purposes, people see exactly how they're supposed to look, why they're supposed to be served in a manner, and the popular answers to the frequently asked questions like what's in the sauce. How many ounces are on a plate? Uh, where do we put the bread if we put the bread on a plate? So everyone understands by looking and by listening um, how they're supposed to be doing something. And so if the food in the window doesn't look exactly like that video, I know somebody did it wrong and I, and I shouldn't take it to the table. And so this is a new updated way uh, that service works. Uh, it's the selection of staff by design. It's the training of the trainer and it's engaging all senses, and it's by putting some of it on video. Now, why is all this important? If we're talking about the future of service, if we're, why are we spending so much time on staff and understanding the communities they're coming from, the lack of service they see, and the new way of training service? Why? Because it's still the winning formula of hands-on restaurant ownership is still a formula of the three P's, and it always starts with people. It's people plus product equals profit. We may be adjusting the amount of people. We may be adjusting how the people work, where they work, the type of job, but it's still a people business. So it's, it's very, very important that we do the selection and the training of the trainer program. And we have all the nuances of service training because our people are going to be handling our product. And it's people and product that equals profit. And and why is that so important, especially in COVID, where we're getting, you know, fewer customers, our sales are dramatically off, our dining rooms are restricted. And so it's never been more important than today to, to treat our existing customers with the best, highest level of service because, A, it's one way of saying thank you. B, it's, it's important to show them how important they are to us because we need them more now. We need our existing customer to return more often, to use us in different ways, to call us for delivery, to do curbside pickup, uh, as well as come in when they can. It's the return of customer that equals return on investment. That's another formula for those of you writing down formulas, that ROC equals ROI, the return of your customer. It isn't so much the constant looking for the elusive new customer. We're going to cover a lot of that when we do the entire session on marketing. But it's doing more with the existing customer, the people that already like you. They know you. They know where you are. They have been there. They might be coming semi-regularly. So to show them appreciation, to treat them better, that means that gets them to come maybe one more time or maybe order more when they do come or try you in a different manner, like maybe that Friday family pack special of fish and chips um, that you only do that one day and you only do in that large portion and it's curbside pickup only. And uh, maybe the Millers now start doing that in addition to the coming in every once in a while. Um, all three of those examples raise revenue. Whether an existing customer spends more, an existing customer comes in more, or an existing customer brings someone with them, or an existing customer uses you differently. All of those situations raise revenue, and none of that has to do with the elusive go out and find the new customer. So in the future service model, we're, we're really valuing a new way of treating our staff to get more out of them, a higher level of service. And the reason for that is so that it shows um, a greater uh, level of, uh, of gratitude and need and appreciation to our customer. 
because that gets the customer who already knows and likes us to do this more often. More often means more sales. So ROC is our ROI. Does that make sense? So you probably are asking, you know, I think I've got customers returning now. Why are those customers returning? You know, why do the customers come back? I believe it's because of the experience that you've created. They must be coming back because of the experience you created, and it's the service that creates the experience. So certainly now with limitations of service, the pivoting of service, the limitations of menuing, the limitations on seating, certainly now uh, we need those customers to return more than ever. So that means we need to up our experience more than ever. So just remember to tell all the staff that more important than what was served to a customer. Um, certainly more important than what was charged is how the customer was treated because how gets remembered twice as long. And you know that yourself because, you know, when you're not busy managing a restaurant or operating your own restaurant, you're also a customer. You're shopping. You're buying goods and services. You've been to other neighborhood bars. You go to restaurants. You probably do some curbside pickup or order to go delivery. And aren't you the same way? You know, a couple of days later, you might forget exactly what it was you ordered. You might forget exactly how much did the meatloaf with the skin on mashed potatoes cost. But I bet after a couple of days, you don't forget how you were treated. If you had a friendly, high-level service, then that means you had a good service experience. It brings a smile to your face. You're probably going to call or go back to that place again, aren't you? But if you don't, if you were thinking, no, I don't think those people care very much for me. You know, I mean, I drove up to the parking lot, I got the food, not a hello, not a goodbye. I know I asked for that extra mustard packet. I didn't get it. Um, so I, I don't really see a lot of care. Well, even though the price may have been right, and even though the food may still have tasted good, what is it that you're remembering? So the future of service is all about experience building. It's all about raising the level of the experience because how we do what we do it's remembered much longer than what it was we served and much longer than what it was we charged. And that's the reason why I think you might be seeing, and I certainly encourage people to do this after they've upped their game on selection and training, they get the customer, they get the staff involved in doing little things for the customer. Maybe you've seen some of this where with all the curbside pickup going on now, where there are some restaurants that are putting a little surprise in the curbside bag. So you're driving up to the restaurant, they're coming out, they're giving you a wave, they're putting it in the back seat, everything is convenient, everything is fast. There's a certain element of safety, I think, also in convenience, where whether it's real or not, customers are feeling safer in the pandemic with this wave from the outside, put the food in, there's contactless pain, there's advanced ordering, and then whoop, I drive off. When I get home now, I open up that bag that was safely, securely folded, stapled, and what do I find? Hopefully not just the order, just the way I wanted it, but I might find in there a little flyer that says thank you on one side, appreciation of the business, a reminder of hours, and on the other side, maybe there's a, uh, a uh, promotion for the special for next week. But next week, Wednesday's family to go um, offer is what? And if they do the online ordering or call direct, maybe they get the dinner for two with a uh, sample free fudge nut brownie dessert. So there's always something in there. There's a little extra benefit. There's, you know, there's just a little end of the meal smile. I've even seen some restaurants up their service by sending a, a thank you text. They, you know, now everyone's got your cell number because you've either ordered online, you needed to give it to them, or you ordered by phone. They text you back to tell you where to park to pick up your food. So now what happens is later that night you get a text saying, thank you so much. You know, we see that you ordered the blah, 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 and the blah, blah, blah. We hope that uh, you and your family enjoyed your meal today. And we hope that you'll call again uh, when our special tomorrow is bingo. So it's a thank you and a nice little reminder to be happy, you know, to to uh, keep that top of mind awareness. So those are some things that I I'm seeing where people are trying to up their game and extend their service um, and, it and it's working. Uh, some of you may have remembered when you got phone backs, when you had to phone a restaurant for a reservation. And when you did that, the host or um, hostess would take the number 
And so now the next day, hopefully, you got a phone call. And maybe it was just in your uh, recorder when you got home, or maybe you checked your voicemail, and there's this nice nice voice saying, hi, I'm Megan. I'm Megan from uh, the Anvil. Uh, we see that you dined here last night at 8 o'clock, and I just want to say thank you for choosing us. Hope the experience um, was all that you expected. And if for your next visit there's anything special, a special request or something you would like us to do, please don't hesitate to call and ask me. I'm happy to serve. So those are some of the things that are important. Look at that level of service. That's just a nice, friendly thank you, uh, but mixed in with a the next time kind of a connotation and a personal ask for me and I'll be able to take care of you. So it isn't just what we serve anymore. It isn't just what we charge. It's important, but it's how we do what we do. So let's talk about three specific steps that I'd like to um, I'd like to underline here that I have seen owner operators do to win in the future of service. Three specific steps that I think are very, very important if we want to make this pivot, raise our game, and win, um, beat the other restaurants at the service game. And they're all E's. You could call this the triple E of the future of service. The first E is embrace the change. This industry has changed, and it isn't just a temporary speed bump where we can just wake up from the nightmare called COVID-19 and we're going to go back to the way it was. Because it's modifying customer behavior, we won't be going back. Now, we will go again. We will be busier again. Customers will be in our dining rooms again, but we're going forward serving the customers with a modified consumer behavior than we had pre-COVID. So embrace the change. The second one is engage others. We talked a little bit about that when I mentioned train the trainer, but it's an important attitude shift where management and ownership needs to engage others. Embrace change, engage others. And the third one is then empower your people. Empower your management and staff with these updated um, service techniques and service models and higher level of training. Empower them to do that. We're going to talk a little bit about these in greater detail. First one, embracing change. So unless we've been asleep for the last you know, 11 months, um, we know that our industry can move fast. Scary. If things can change on a dime. Government can tell us things that uh -oh, we've never had to adjust to before. But all of a sudden, in order to operate, we are now uh, sanitizing differently, mask wearing, temperature checking. We have to relay out our dining rooms, manage the way we sanitize, uh, redo our air filtration, install plexiglass, manage one at a time restaurant visits. We move fast and we must adjust. So it isn't just those sanitary guides, but we must adjust to how the customer's expecting us to operate. Safety, sanitation also means convenience, and it didn't before. The second thing to adjust to is that smaller is now the buzzword. Smaller is the key. Future restaurants will probably be smaller. We have to be successful with smaller seats available in our dining room. Um, size of restaurants may not have to be that big. Certainly size of staff may not have to be that big in the future. We're going to be getting more done by fewer people. We're going to have to be doing more in our restaurant in a smaller space. Part of that is because of the growing cost of occupancy. Part of that's the growing cost of our operations that are coming with government rules, regulations, hourly wages, et cetera. But then the other part is because of the changing consumer habit. They're going to be using the restaurants differently. People will be sitting outside on a regular basis. People will be doing more takeout. People are going to expect to have that curbside delivery. Um, people are going to be wondering if you're going to be doing larger packages that I can buy, freeze, and sort of thaw and bake later, or the grab and go. Um, we've seen restaurants now successfully package their product for sale in retail markets grocery stores, uh, and restaurants successfully use retail goods as driving forces in takeout packages. A restaurant I go to has local farmers, local pro um, provide, uh, purveyors that they buy from. And so when you order a takeout for a, a very little extra, they will put things in your bag, like a special sauce 
that they get from a small provider or special olive oil. It used to be paper towels and toilet tissue and bottled water and hand sanitizer. Well, now that those items aren't maybe as necessary, but yet customers got used to getting them and we like them. So now they just moved us to other items. And that's just, it's just a different way to keep people attracted to ordering from them. So adjusting how you do your takeout, adjusting how you operate um, is, is, is just something we're going to have to continue to do. It's not going to go away. This, that wasn't a short-term blip. Becoming more efficient. Some of you have probably found how in order to be successful when your revenue drops so bad, you changed your service model. You either had your dining room closed or you had it much smaller. You used fewer people. You may have come up with a smaller menu, and you started doing takeout, to-go, delivery, family package promotions. Uh, a lot of restaurants that I worked with did that successfully, and they noticed that, you know what, we're more efficient when we have fewer people in the kitchen working on a more limited menu. Um, we don't have all of the volume that we used to have, obviously. But if we can operate at 60, 70, 75% of that volume, but with my new more efficient model, I find that I'm just as profitable. So efficiency, the use of technology and consistency in systems means that we can do things correctly, we can be more profitable, and we can use fewer people. Um, operations and training is a change. We, we talked about that earlier, uh, but we want to embrace the change in how we're going to select, do initial training, and do ongoing training of our staff. Uh, another major change, of course, that we need to embrace is how we market. Digital marketing, social media, email blasts to our current customers to welcome them into your safe and sanitary surroundings or to offer the different specials that they can get that are only available to go, pick up, third-party delivery, carry out. Um, the more we talk to our existing customers, the more they bond with us. Uh, and also the smarter we are because they'll tell us if we ask them, you know, what they are liking about our offerings. By taking a look at our daily sales reports, we know, we know what they feel are um, our branded products and what's most important, right? So the more we stay close to our guests, and we do that now through social media postings and email blasts and email surveys, the smarter we are. So we gotta embrace the change that we found. Then the second thing is we really, really win when we engage others. I can't tell you how many restaurants have told me that um, because they had to move quickly and because they had to furlough so many people, the only way they were able to make it is by engaging the staff and getting them involved and helping with the creative way of pivoting the operation, developing new steps of service, helping by changing their job from dining room server to packaging procuring or curbside delivery, uh, adjusting to the new phone orders. So the more the staff got involved, the easier these changes became, and, and the better the suggestions are. So there are, there, are, there are countless stories of how this, you know, has helped in restaurants where once the staff is involved, uh, they feel, you know, more of a part of the solution rather than I got furloughed because I'm an expense. Uh, business is off, and um, obviously labor is the problem. Uh, well, if we rework labor and we get them to help us think of creative ways we can do, um, then um, not only do we get the idea and can can it work, but it works better because they're part of the process and they bonded. They bonded with us. Some owners that have started staff meetings more regularly, like weekly, just to discuss uh, the needs of the business, the volume level we're at, and what ideas they might have for how we could contact our current customers, what would be the better ideas for specials, have found that this has been a tremendous help. That I've started naming them the weekly quality circle, just because people are interested in coming up with suggestions that just help the quality of life as a, as a staff member, the quality of the revenue, um, the quality of the product. And so if you do that regularly, you'll find that they that they'll come up with the right suggestions, they'll bond with you, and all of a sudden now, you're being known as a good listener. Um, and sometimes restaurant owners have been working with staff for, you know, 10, 20 years, but just because of the way we were structured, the way we delegated, and the way we followed up, uh, the lack of involvement that we had from staff, um, they never 
saw us as good listeners. Um, but just last week that happened in a small restaurant in Houston when I was talking to the owner and he said, yeah, you know, we're, we're operating totally different, but it's okay. We're getting by the staff. And now uh, came up to me and said, you know, really, Dimitri, you know, you, um, you're a good listener. He's like, I never really thought I was. Well, we just weren't in this position before. So regular meetings have changed. You want the communication to be more regular and you want it to be more equal, more involved, more what do you think, more what are the suggestions, help me come up with things. How many of you have been running meetings with staff? Totally different. Infrequent and typically the one person talks, that's the owner or the manager, and it's normally because it's been a while since we've had a meeting, so I've got a lot of reminders I've got to get out there because you guys are lax and you're slipping, and I've got some problems that I haven't seen, and I finally had it. So I thought, Saturday morning, before we get started, everyone come in, and we're going to have a meeting. Okay, I can remember meetings like that. Um, COVID changed all that. Now it's more regular, it's more friendly, it's more interactive. Uh, but before, those other meetings really needed to go away because they didn't necessarily educate and they didn't necessarily involve. They were basically just telling. And you know what I mean. You would sit there, and that's the way I used to do it years ago. I got you all here together because I need to tell you what's been going wrong, and I need to tell you what you're not paying attention to. And I've had it with some of these specific things that have just gotten carried away. And then before you know it, you go down the litany of lists on who's parking in the wrong place. And who's always asking for their paychecks on Tuesday when you know that paychecks are available Wednesday at 2 in the afternoon? And who shows up wearing dirty aprons? And who's always 15 minutes late? And why is somebody always on the phone talking to their boyfriend? So that's what we used to do with our service staff. And we would call that a meeting. Well, it wasn't information. It wasn't motivational. The only person that felt good about that was the person with the clipboard, the owner or the manager. So then what would happen at the end of that meeting, we'd say, good, whew, I feel better. Now, everyone, <clears throat> pay attention, you know, stay on the straight and narrow and go on the good shift. It was demoralizing. So COVID has taught us that if we're going to have a smaller staff uh, and we're going to have them cross-trained and we're going to ask for their suggestions, it's much easier for them to bond with us. It's much easier for them to feel a sense of responsibility. And that means it's much easier for us to also hold them accountable. So everything gets easier when they're involved. And hopefully that means that there's less often the need for the reprimand for the dirty apron or the parking in the wrong place um, or uh, eating the wrong item for employee meal or whatever else that goes wrong. I'm not saying that that will go away entirely because it doesn't. But those items are really best handled one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but to, to develop a successful culture and a climate of success, um, those are not meeting topics. Those are one-on-one -on -one reprimands. So staff involvement, engagement of others, getting suggestions, regular meetings, but let's not leave out the customer. Um, during COVID, we started doing something that really made sense, and I wish we would have been doing it for years before COVID, and that was involving the customer, the customer that's on your email list, the person that you're promoting to. Why not every few months when you send out um, the next email teaser or the next special promotion, um, uh, connect a few questions to the bottom to ask them a quick survey of things that they prefer, um, restaurants that they order from when they're not busy ordering from you. Uh, then you can easily check to compare, say, prices, atmosphere, level of service to where other people are going. Uh, your customers will tell you, uh, not just by the, you know, uh, item sales mix on what they order more. But they'll tell you if you're asked about suggestions and service level and promotions that work and promotions that don't. Um, it's hard, I know now, to try to get a group together. Um, but there are some restaurants that are doing very successful by doing Zoom groups of interested customers that want to have a, and some do it on different days, but the one that I'm thinking now is still doing the Thursday wine group. So the people that used to come once a month to taste new wines and, um, pair them with different menu items are now on Zoom having an opportunity where the manager or the owner is still talking to at least eight, nine, ten customers. They're at home, but they're all raising a glass of wine, and he's still doing some wine education, and it gives them an opportunity to explain why they want to carry this new wine and why it pairs well with, you know, the um, chicken enchilada with hot red sauce. So customer involvement, utilizing technology, 
surveying through emails, focus grouping just changes, use technology, it works. And then the last thing, I guess, in order to engage others correctly, is to stay tuned to the industry trends. Never before has it been important to stay close to your regional hospitality association or your state restaurant association uh, because trend information is being made available monthly on um, shifts in uh, customer taste, uh, openings and closing, menu items, uh, purveyor specials, as well as legal issues, labor-related issues, PPP CARES Act, et cetera. So having a con commitment to continually improve can't really be done without engaging others. So after we embrace the change, we've got to engage others to win with the future of service. I hope that makes sense. Then the third one is once that's done, we have to kind of step back, direct, and empower our people, empowering management to be in charge of rolling out whatever it was the group decided we were doing, your key people, your trainers. For some of you, it might be a kitchen manager because you're hands-on and you're running the front of the house. For some of you, it may be the opposite. You may be the chef owner, So we're talking about the front of the house. Uh, manager. Some of you might be owners of multiple restaurants, so you're checking on the general managers. Whatever structure you have, if we're going to go from empowering and engaging, um, then we've got to kind of let them do and, and show us how what they've suggested is going to work. So if we're going to embrace and they're part of that process, we're going to engage with them and they've made uh, an effort and the suggestions, then we've got to turn it around and say, great, now let's come up with a plan. What are our new expectations going to be? And a lot of your key employees have not been privy to what your expectations are, what your service plan is, what the customer experience should be. A lot of owners have just kind of held that in. What are, what are our revenue expectations? What's our marketing plan? Have them help you develop that, and then it helps them show you how they can implement it. Because owners are really better when we play the role as the what people, what our standards are, what our goals should be, what revenue should hit, what the guest experience should be. And then key staff and managers are best when they're expected to be the how people. So they can turn to you and say, okay, I get it. If that's what we're all about, that's what the mission is, that's what the steps of service are supposed to be, that's what the guest experience is supposed to be, then my job, Mr. Owner, is to show you how I can best do it. And so empower them to do it. How they, how they handle the staff, how they handle um, the guests at the table, how they handle the supervision of facility cleanliness, how they handle the implementation of your to-go marketing program, you know, have them be in charge of that. And then review your plan regularly. Whatever your plan is should be reviewed and adjusted on a quarterly basis. There should be specific monthly goals that managers and key people are given. So then they can, again, they can tell you if that's what the goal is, then my job is how to get you there. So if there's a weekly objective, if there's a monthly goal, and they are empowered to get it done, again, they have a feeling of responsibility, and that's wonderful. Staff want that. And also owners want that level of holding them accountable. So what people feel they're responsible for, they should be accountable for, and it balances. So that's what the empowerment means. So it starts with the embracing the change that we're in, making the best of it, the engaging of others to develop, you know, the new ways of winning, and then empowering people to implement that based on the decisions that you've made. So if we do that correctly, we now have a culture of service. The future of service isn't just the result of one or two servers. The future of service isn't just because someone's been there a long time and they're friendly. The future of service is a working environment. It's, it's, it's an awareness. It's a bonding from the new person to the experienced person that they've been empowered to deliver what the owner expects. That's a culture of service. Uh, and that happens when owners are are clear and they they share their purpose. So with everything that we've been talking about, with the new ways to select, the new ways to train, the ways to do continual communication and train, um, let's make sure that there's clarity, that everyone understands, because we've shared our purpose. 
our reason, our mission. And there's specific objectives of what we want this restaurant to do in this community. And everybody knows that. And then there's communication regularly, sincerely, equally, participatory, and we listen. And then third is we're consistent. The best way to win and come out of COVID stronger is to have these steps, have these plans, and then stay the course because you're going to have a plan to work by. And you'll review it, you'll adjust it, you'll approve it where necessary, and that's how you'll succeed. Because I wish you all to have that, to have a culture of service, a working environment that is positive, where everyone is on the same um, page, uh, working in the same direction. And the reason we want to do all of that is because, you know, it's worth it. Um, we will always require service, always. It may look a little different. It may be faster. It might be over the phone. It might be more online. It might be more convenient. It might be more delivery. It may not always be, in other words, the same seven steps of service that we delivered at the counter or that we delivered at the table. But we will always require service. We will always need people. Customers will always need restaurants because we're a social people at heart. You know, we, we really, really are. Uh, we'll find different ways of being social. It's the reason why uh, a year or so ago, no one even knew what Zoom was. And now I think people are Zooming um, constantly. It's because it's their one way to have social contact and, and see. Um, and people just can't wait to get out and, and touch um, and be public. Um, more often than they are now, again, because at heart, we're a social people. So we just have to adjust to meet the new normal. The new normal is doing good, good service, but doing it quicker. We have to have a, an element of convenience, and we have to do this all with keeping sincerity. The basic bottom line is using the, the new normal, using the technology that people are expecting, balanced with the personal service that they're deserving. That's the bottom line, and that's what we're shooting for. And hopefully that's why you were interested enough to tune in, because that's what you're committed to. So in the future, the leaders of service-minded concepts, the people who are putting service first, the winners in the future of service, uh, are not people that are fearful very much of competition. Um, they're not fearful of, say, increasing costs. We're spending a lot of time on that now. What's going to happen to occupancy? What's going to happen to labor? You know, um, how much are costs going to go up? Uh, energy costs, how's that going to impact fuel and delivery of goods? Um, but future leaders of service aren't that fearful of what their competitors are doing or what increased costs might lead to. And they're not necessarily fearful of tighter labor markets that we're always in. And right now the industry is in pain because companies that have furloughed hospitality staff may have lost some. Some come back, some don't. And, you know, there's many restaurants that have noticed that they've closed, and then when they reopen, some of their staff now look at our, our, our industry that is something fragile that, you know, could be broken again, that isn't as permanent as it once was. Some have already adjusted to working for online ordering companies, or, or we see them making deliveries for UPS, FedEx, or Amazon. So there's going to be tighter labor markets. I get it. But what leaders of service will fear is mediocrity because the, the enemy of the future of service is the acceptance of mediocrity. If we accept a service level, that's just okay. If we accept product that is inconsistent, you know, if we are accepting people just because we need them, uh, not because they really fit, they're not going to last long, they didn't listen to training, then what we're doing is, we're not leading with service first. We're not, you know, engaging, um, embracing, empowering. What we are is we're settling for mediocrity. That's what the, le the future leaders of service will fear and nothing else. And listen, I'm going to want to wrap up now uh, because I noticed we may just have 10 to 15 minutes left on the program. And what I'd love to do is revisit some points that you may have some questions about or want to visit with more or answer some questions that maybe um, you have. If there was a light bulb that blinked halfway through the program and you'd like to discuss something, um, 
please, uh, fire away. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. I actually have a couple of questions that I put in the chat box. Um, what advice do you have for a restaurant owner, a new restaurant owner that's having trouble, I guess, attracting the right staff? Uh, they have staff, but they're unreliable. So they actually, it's kind of a, a crapshoot about how many, who's going to show up and how many will be there and can they handle the uh, service? Yeah. Okay. Good question. If you're a new restaurant, you've got staff now, uh, maybe some of them are actually compatible with what you're doing. Some aren't. And that, and that's what's creating that issue with uh, the crackpot behavior, the some that aren't going to show up and you just don't really know if you're going to have the whole team there. I would quickly start rallying the ones that do. You know, if you've got a small staff, but you've got the one or two that get it, that you feel like are responsible, that you know that you could build around, um, I would quickly, step one, sit with them. Identify with them and say, you, you know, you guys can maybe help me because you know what the problem is. Uh, I like the way you're working. You're trying hard, uh, but I know you're not happy if you're surrounded by people that, A, don't care or don't show up, uh, and you have to carry their load. I don't want to lose you, and I don't want to lower my standards to accept those that are going to create that negativity, that 50% job, or that uh, no-show kind of attitude. So I'd rally around those that do. Make sure that they feel confident. Uh, that you're going to fix the issue, comfortable that they're involved in it. Because if not, you wind up always losing the good ones. Um, you know, especially in smaller communities, it's like people will lower the service level to the poor performer. If that's okay to get by, then that's all I need to do. Well, that in itself is a problem, but it creates a second problem. Those that really do want to do better, they will just find an environment where they belong. So now you've lost the good ones. So step one is rally around the couple. And then step two is reward them for bringing in people. Um, when, when people are in tight labor markets and when people are, say, a new brand, they don't have a, a big following, they don't have a lot of staff, a lot of them will tell you that, you know what I did is I just started making a model from the staff that were good in the kitchen or on the floor. And I rewarded them. I said, look, this is the model we're looking for. People that are willing to work like you or do this or that and, and work this kind of schedule. Um, now, you know, your friends or people that are working in other places that you would like to have them work with you, if you can interest them in coming to uh, interview, uh, you get rewarded somehow. If they are hired and stay, for a month, you get some type of a bonus. Uh, so now what you've got is staff not only doing a good job, but staff out there promoting your best interest because you know they want to get the one or two people that are at the bars or restaurants that they go to that they like to work with them so it can make work more enjoyable and they're going to get a bonus on their paycheck after this new person is hired and maybe last a month or something. So mm -hmm. those are a couple of steps that you can do. Um, the one step you didn't hear me mention is okay, we're going to have to continually work with those bad apples. You're going to have to do the best you can to work around them, uh, carry them, because I know you need them. No, you want to cut that as quick as you can, um, because it, it, you're not going to get a higher level of service from someone who didn't listen to training, doesn't really care, shows up only half of the time. That's, that's you, you want to set an example for the other staff that that's not uh, acceptable. Uh, we're not going to accept the mediocrity. We're going to do anything we can um, to go find other people to bring in and replace them. Oh, excellent advice. Excellent. Uh, I, you talked about this briefly. Um, what are some good promotions that you have seen in the industry? Like, uh, I think you mentioned uh, come in on Wednesday, you get a free uh, fudge brownie or something like that. Uh, what are some promotions that will not end up being uh, costly to the restaurant owner, but still be a perk for the customer? Great question. Yeah, depending upon the concept, everyone kind of has to figure out their own. Um, 
but I'll, but I'll give you some good examples from actual restaurants, small, independent, hands-on operators, what they've been doing is quite work for them. Um, uh, one restaurant is in a small um, community. I forget the name. I think it's called La Mesa. Anyway, it's a small town outside of San Diego. Uh, and Sean and Rosa, his wife, and they don't mind me talking about them, they're doing very, very well with the way they had to pivot their restaurant. Their, their restaurant uh, was a um, single-unit uh, sports bar that featured regional barbecue. So I know here we are in Texas, and I mentioned California and barbecue in the same sentence. Forgive me. Uh, I don't necessarily know if we could say that that was a credible product. But in any event, that, that's not the question. We're not, it's not a barbecue review. It's a promotion that works. So they found themselves going zip down to zero sales because when the middle of March came, uh, every you know they had to close inside dining. You could still do takeout. And you could do curbside, much like most of the state of Texas. So they looked at each other and said, that doesn't work for us. We're a sports bar. We're all about everything that no one is allowed to do right now. You go to a sports bar so you can watch 30 TVs. You can group with other people, jump up and down, yell and scream and, you know, at the football game, um, drink together, eat together, large gathering for a long period of time. Well, no one could gather. No one could do inside dining. And bars were told to close. So they went down to like zip. So what he did is he thought, I'm going to take my most popular food items, things that I know people like. I'm going to come up with a way of doing the sports package series. So on Monday, I'll do my Monday night sports package, and it is the three dozen wings with free fries. So he found that by doing large portioning, uh, people would order uh, for the group. So they, they still had a small group at home. Maybe it was just husband and wife and kids, or maybe it was three guys, you know, getting together to watch the game on TV. But he felt that was the only way that he could sort of give his image to takeout. So here's a restaurant that was doing maybe 10% of their sales on takeout, and now all of a sudden all they can do is takeout. So his promotions were each day a different item, and I'm going to make these items my regular menu items. So it isn't like something expensive I got to buy or something that I don't think anyone likes, something that might be spoiled and get thrown away. We're going to do sliders on one day. We're going to do chopped beef on one day. We're going to do pulled pork. We're going to do slab of ribs Saturday. We're going to do Monday night wings. I forgot a couple of them, but he did these portions for two, portions for four, and only one each night. And so because he did some tremendous email marketing to his existing customers, uh, people were responding. And so now he's doing, instead of like, say, 10% of his old revenue and takeout, he's up to about 50, 55% of his old revenue in curbside pickup. So that's still not tremendous money, but because he's only engaging a limited menu, he only needs a couple people in the kitchen. He has no bar, no hostess, no servers. He has instead a couple people that do the running that will package and run to the, to the car. So like he said, he's able to maintain some profit, and his customers are staying connected to him. That's the most important thing is no one knew how long this might last. We still don't know. So marketing wants to keep people connected. So that was one thing that he did was one item a day, take it from your regular menu, don't have to menu the other things, so you're lessening your inventory, less prep, less chance of waste, and then do a tremendous marketable deal for a large portion, dinner for two, dinner for four, that kind of thing. Um, closer to home, uh, in, in Texas, there was a more upper casual restaurant. I don't, I don't mean was, there is. Uh, and they were in the same dynamic. They said, we got to think of some promotions. And um, we're a high-volume sort of European bistro. People come in here to sip champagne, do wine tasting, eat meat and cheese boards. And these are not really conducive to takeout. So when the dining room closed, uh, we've got to do email marketing. We've got to do takeout packaging. We've got to do curbside pickup. We don't really know how to do it because only about 5% of the time people were taking food home. So the uh, restaurant's called Abuzi, A-B-O-U-Z-Y. You can look them up. They are having such success with these everyday takeout-only specials. They're typically at dinner for two. Um, and um, what their point of difference is, and maybe some of you listeners 
do have liquor, beer, and wine licenses, so you can package that with your takeout now because, you know, they modified the law in the state of Texas. Some of you it might not uh, pertain to, but because they were sort of that bistro wine cheese board place, what they did is they have all this wine in inventory. So they said, why don't we include a bottle that pairs nicely with the meatloaf Tuesday, with the fish fry Friday, with the um, pounded veal Sunday. So we'll roll the bill and all we'll do is just cover the cost of the bottle. So they were using the bottle like grocery stores use milk as the loss leader to get you to order. And they thought it's okay because we have it in inventory anyway. If we just cover our cost, it's not like we have any extra labor. It's not like we have any extra utilities, but if it helps us sell 10, 20, 30, 40 extra of these packaged meals, it will help. So now people are noticing that, hey, they can spend $50 on a dinner for two, and it comes with a nice bottle of wine. It's been phenomenally successful for their concept. So they, they now sell anywhere from 20, 30 to as many as 100 of these meals a day. And because they're running, you know, smaller staff, limited menu, they're making a little bit of money, and it's been so popular, they realize that when COVID finally is done and dining maybe resumes some of the old normalcy, they don't feel like they're going to be able to drop these promotions. Too many of their staff look forward to the Fish Friday, the Veal Saturday, and, you know, the other things that they're doing. So what they thought might have just been a temporary fix to keep some people employed and try to cover cost has now become a profitable promotion, and they probably can't get away from it. Um, uh, I've got a Greek restaurant client that is uh, doing that same thing. Um, uh, fast food, uh, you know, restaurants are doing that where they'll pick a certain day to run a promotion. Uh, and they'll pick like maybe a Monday or a Tuesday. But what happens is because you've got top of mind awareness, people start going back to that restaurant on different days. Even though I can't get that second cheeseburger for half price because that was cheeseburger Tuesday. But because I like the promotion, I always see the emails. Um, I forgot my cheeseburger, buy one, get the second one for half price on Tuesday, but that's okay. I was there Wednesday, and I bought the fish sandwich because that was their promo. <laughs> that's a true story. So <laughs> so kind of be creative, everybody. Think of what's working in your restaurant. What are you known for? Don't go, you know, to buy something cheap just because your Cisco salesman says, you know, other people like these stuffed mushrooms, so why don't you throw them on your menu item for free? If, if it isn't part of your concept, it's not worth promoting. But if it is part of your concept, make something special about it. Make it a dinner for two or a family package, and then promote that to people. Uh, and maybe you make it a limited offer where it's only one item a day each week. Um, and then finally, another promotion that you might pick is promoting something in a um, – uh, in a different uh, area. Um, I've got some restaurants that are now promoting some of their product to uh, a friend of theirs who does food truck on the other side of town. So he comes and he's buying, say, 40 or 50 of their burritos. So now people know that, hey, you mean I can get Mel's burrito? Yeah, you can get it temporarily only on Saturdays from this food truck over at the farmer's market. Uh, and there's people that are doing that. And because of that, we've actually found some restaurants that have been selling some of their food in grocery stores. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that, you know, in your area, but uh, in most major markets, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Houston, for sure, most major markets like Kroger, HEB, and whatnot have reached out to at least 10 or 12 restaurants and brought their recipes into their kitchen so they could batch and put into their deli um, local restaurant food uh, like uh, Carnitas from Hugo's which is an independent operator. And now you can buy Carnitas for two at HEB. Uh, Brennan's has now got shrimp and grits, bread pudding, and turtle soup at HEB. And these just started out as limited time promotions, but because they're going so well, they may continue them, you know, long after the dining room comes back. Wow, those are excellent ideas. Uh, that sounds kind of like what happened up here with Fletcher's Corny Dog whenever the fair had to cancel this year. And so they started selling Fletcher's Corny Dogs for a short amount of time at some of the uh, Golden Chick restaurants, I think. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Um, there is a actual um, SBDC um, a client um, uh, with a food truck. And um, 
she is now, uh, she's got a food truck with very interesting egg rolls. The egg rolls have nothing to do with Asian stuffing. It's like brisket mac and cheese egg rolls, Caribbean spiced chicken egg roll. But anyway, she's one food truck, and she came in because she wanted uh, help with some planning um, and um, batch recipe increasing because she's been asked to sell packages. And she's now at, I think, four different farmer's markets where they're selling, um, it's either eight or 10 in a package, frozen. So she's now got like a sideline business. It's her brand getting great recognition. And she never thought that she was going to be selling them by packages before. Well, because this has started and she's got some pretty good success, we're trying to get her into major commercial kitchens to get FDA approval, nutrition analysis done, all the labeling done, so she can start doing website uh, shipping nationwide. And, that, and so a food truck operator just looking for a farmer's market promotion, but it works so well. And now we're, look where she might go. So where can I find that food truck? Yeah, exactly. excellent. Yeah. yeah, Lynn is such a neat lady. We enjoy working with her. Um, it's called Saucy Nosh. So you can look her up online. Um, she's only in the, um, uh, in the Houston area. Uh, but hopefully she'll be able to sell her package product through distributors. So Saucy Nosh Egg Rolls, you know, hopefully sooner than later, might be in a, uh, you know, in a market near you. Fantastic. And well, thank you so much, Chris, for joining us. Oh, and you're so welcome. I know, I know we've had some technical difficulties, but we're going to get those worked out, I promise. Um, well, I look forward to the remaining program. I hope uh, listeners got some information that's usable today um, and uh, look forward to getting to talk to you all now about um, menu and marketing and knowing your numbers and these are the kinds of things that we'll touch base on in the upcoming weeks. Yes, we have a slide up right now that talks about our upcoming webinars. Um, oh, next week is busy. On uh, Tuesday the 2nd, we have the hottest topic on the market right now, the PPP, the newest updates. Uh, that's with Rebecca Schultz. On the 3rd, on Wednesday, we have legal contracts and agreement fundamentals with Tisha Dodge. And then we have you back, Chris, on the 4th, next Thursday, for uh, menu best practices. Then you're back on the 11th. Uh, where have all the leaders gone? And then on the 18th, Restaurant Reality, Know Your Numbers. That one I'm really looking forward to. So mm -hmm. um, anybody can uh, register for any of these webinars by going to our SBDC uh, website. That's sbdc.nctc.edu. There you can register for any of the webinars. You can find contact information or you can schedule an appointment with an advisor. Uh, plus, we have a lot of resources for small business owners on that site. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors today, uh, the Small Business Administration, the State of Texas, North Texas SBDC Regional Office, and North Central Texas College. I do want to remind everyone you'll be receiving a survey uh, in, in your email, and we would appreciate you completing that survey and returning it. We use that information to help improve our programs and make sure that the information that we're sharing with you is relevant to your business. Thank you all for joining today, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks so much, and this will end the webinar.